slipstream caught between realities. A secret museum of the esoteric. The private library of shadows. All taking place in a world forged from mystery and caught between logic and myth. You are entering the reality. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for listening tonight. Of course, as always... My name is Sandman, and I'll be your guide through this strange realm of ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, aliens, conspiracy theories, and other unsolved mysteries that I like to call parareality. Well, I'm really excited to be here with you tonight. Not only has it been a minute since I've been able to get a podcast episode out due to unforeseen circumstances, um, but it's the start of my summer series. And I know that it's not officially summer yet, but it's still time for the summer series to kick off because it's June. And if you've listened to this podcast for any length of time, you know that every summer I pick one topic and I spread it out over three episodes in June, July, and August. And this year I started planning the summer series all the way, all the way back in February. So I've been itching to get it to you. And tonight is the night. Now, for those of you who have been long-time listeners of this show, you know that even though my secret bunker is based right outside of Nashville and I live in the Nashville area, that I didn't grow up here. I wasn't born here. My home state is Alabama. I grew up there and I lived there until the end of 2002 when I moved here to the Nashville area. And like most southern states, Alabama has no shortage of tales of ghosts and hauntings thanks to its long history of slavery and civil war battles that were fought in the state. But did you know that Alabama also has more than its share of cryptids? In fact, the state has several cryptids, most of which you've probably never even heard of. Now, I briefly touched on one of them um, a few years ago, in a prior episode, and I looked through my archives, and I just can't find the episode where I talked about this, but it's called the Alabama White Thing, T-H-A-N-G, because you know that you got to pronounce it with a southern draw, so it's not the thing, it's thang. Um, but that's probably about Alabama's most um, famous cryptid, is the Alabama White Thing. And I thought that it would be a great idea for me to bring all of those other creatures to light and try to get them to the attention that they deserve. So that's what my summer series is all about. It's about Alabama legends, Alabama cryptids, Alabama ghosts and hauntings, all things paranormal Alabama. So tonight I present to you part one of my summer series, Five Alabama Cryptids, and one hoax. And of course, to learn more, you'll have to turn on, tune in, and find out. Now, lately, I have been skipping the email section, and I've been talking about other things. However, I wanted to get back to it, as I received a very interesting email. Actually, it was a Facebook message not too long ago. And it sparked a debate between, well, I'm not going to say debate. It sparked an open conversation between myself and the person who wrote the email. And it was a a very cordial conversation. It was a very good conversation. And and in some ways, it was an eye-opening conversation. So I'm going to read this to you. This comes from Nicholas. And he uh, messaged me on Facebook, and this is what Nicholas had to say. I listened to you guys for the first time today. I enjoyed it, but then you randomly went on a triad about Muslims and the Clintons. Are y'all the QAnon nationalist people? It was a high-quality podcast until you went on that triad about Muslims wanting to take over the world. So unnecessary and racist. And no, I'm not a Muslim. I'm an atheist. Well, I had no earthly idea what in the heck Nicholas was referring to. So I sent him an email and and said, uh, hey, uh, 
you know, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. Can you give me the episode that you were listening to so I can um, go back and, and try to figure out what's going on with this? And it turns out the episode that he was listening to was the Lisa Marie Presley uh, death conspiracy theories episode. And in that episode, on the first half of it, uh, Easy E and I were talking about uh, just random uh, com- conspiracy theories. And it turns out it was all a misunderstanding uh, by Nicholas on what we were discussing. So in the first half, um, I asked Eric, uh, we I can't remember exactly what uh, prompted me to ask this, but I asked Eric, Easy E as I love to call him, if he had ever seen this movie called The Long Kiss Goodnight, and he had not. And it's, uh, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a, a mid-90s action spy movie starring uh, uh, Samuel L. Jackson and uh, Gina Davis. Uh, as a matter of fact, Gina Davis plays the lead role, and Samuel L. is the uh, the co star. And in the movie, she is a secret government spy who loses her memory and drops off the radar for like I don't know ten years or something like that. Gets married, has a family, and um, slowly throughout this movie, uh, she she regains her, her memories back and realizes that she's a government spy. And she was in the middle of trying to stop this government, um, spy organization that she worked with, which never really was named, but, uh, she found out that they were actually in the middle of, uh, a plot to, um, fake a terrorist attack on United States soil. Now this movie was, I think done in, uh, 96, I believe was when this movie came out. And the, in the movie, the, the, the terrorist plot or the fake terrorist plot was something like this in a nutshell. So the secret government agency had had their funding cut by the government. They needed money to keep on operating. So they hired the bad guys that they've been chasing all these years to help them plan this fake terrorist attack. So they took a Middle Eastern man who was not necessarily a Muslim. He was just Middle Eastern. And nowhere in the exchange between me and Eric did we say anything about him being Muslims or him being a Muslim. Uh, But he was a Middle Eastern man. They killed this guy. Uh, They froze his body and they stole a bomb, put it in a big rig over the road truck, put the Middle Eastern man's body in the driver's seat of the truck, and they drove it to a to this little town where they were going to uh, explode this bomb. And there's going to be approximately uh, three to four thousand people they estimated that were going to be killed, and it was going to they had it all set up to where the Middle Eastern man's body would be found. He would get blamed for it. It would look like a terrorist attack because he was a foreigner. And uh, then they would get their funding back, and they would be able to go fight the bad guys again. And uh, so that was what we were talking about. Uh, And Nicholas misunderstood uh, the whole conversation, I think, and um, that was... That's, that prompted him to send me that email. Um, so we had a very nice email exchange. And, um, you know, I, I did go back and, and listen to that. I told him I would. I went back. I, I listened to the episode. Um, I figured out what was going on. I emailed him and said, hey, you know, I, I think this was a misunderstanding on your part. And this is what we were talking about. And, um, you know, I I'm, I think that... Um, you just misunderstood what the intent or the, the the basis of the conversation was. And he really appreciated that. And uh, I bring all this up for two reasons. Number one, because I wanted to apologize 
uh, on behalf of myself and Eric, if anybody heard that conversation that we had and thought the same way that Nicholas did, that we were uh, bashing Muslims and saying that Muslims were going to take over the world and stuff like that, that was not what was the, the conversation was about. At no point did we say anything like that. Um, we were just talking about the plot of a movie and how that plot of that movie kind of resembled what went on with the 9-11 attacks where there was a foreign attack by Middle Eastern people on the United States and there's about 3,000 people that were killed in the World Trade Center attacks on, on the 9-11. So we made that comparison and we were talking about how Hollywood kind of sometimes predicts the future like that in these weird ways. And like I said, I, I think that Nicholas just kind of misunderstood where we were coming from with that. So if anybody else heard that and came to the same conclusion that Nicholas did and thought that we were uh, um, trashing Muslims and saying Muslims were going to take over the world or that they are responsible for all terrorist acts or whatever, then uh, that was certainly was not our intent. That was not the point we were making. And I urge you to go back and take a listen to the Lisa Marie Presley conspiracy theory episode and just really listen to what it was that we were saying. And the second reason I brought this up is because um, this is a perfect example of how people can have a disagreement about something and yet have a rational, decent, respectful conversation and resolve the issue. And that's what happened between Nicholas and I. Um, I did not, his initial email, I did not take any offense to it. Um, I was very confused by it, you know, none to say the less. Um, that's why I asked him, can you tell me the episode I went back, I listened to it, I promised him I would, I did exactly what I said I was going to, and we had a very nice email exchange, and it was very cordial, and um, you know, he said that he was going to give the podcast another another try, and he was going to listen to it again. He did say it was a high-quality podcast and that he enjoyed it, but he just misunderstood what we were talking about. So if you have a disagreement with somebody out there, it's so easy because of the internet and the world we live in, it's so easy just to make veiled threats when you don't have to look at someone in the eye and man up and, and, and say those things. You can hide behind the anonymity of the internet and you can say and, and, and do things that um, you don't have the courage or the guts to do in real life. And a lot of people take advantage of that. And, there's where you get this online bullying. It's where a lot of just bad stuff happens. And this is a perfect example of how you can not fall into that trap. This is a perfect example of how two people can have a misunderstanding and have a rational, decent, respectful conversation and then come to an understanding at the end. So I want to say to Nicholas, thank you for your email Thank you for having a decent, respectful, polite conversation with me via email. And thank you for bringing this faux pas to my attention, although I, I still don't think it was necessarily a faux pas. I do think it was a misunderstanding, but I can see where some people might misconstrue what we were saying. So it gives me an opportunity as well to say, hey, you know, that's not our conversation. That's not what it was about. Please don't think that uh, we were not intending to offend anyone. And that is that. So thank you, Nicholas, for your email. And thank you for listening to the podcast. I really do. If you'd like to leave a comment about tonight's episode of Parareality, have an idea for a topic you'd like me to cover or a story you'd like to tell, email me at sandman at parareality.com or call the secret bunker at 615-692-1170 and leave a message. Don't forget to follow Para Reality on social media. You can find the podcast on Facebook at sandman.parareality or follow me on Twitter and Instagram under the username at Radio. 
You can also find Parareality on YouTube under the username Parareality1. Parareality.com is not only the home of the podcast on the web, but it's also where you can find paranormal news from all around the world in the Paranews section and listen to past episodes in the archive section, all for the price of absolutely nothing. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can buy yourself some swag in the official Parareality shop while you're there. You can also support the podcast for free by leaving me a three-star or better review on whatever podcast app you're listening on. Your reviews help the podcast to grow and reach even more people, and I would appreciate it very much. I'd love to hear from you guys, so send me those emails. Thank you. Era Reality is a proud member of the Straight Up Strange Podcast Network. To learn more about all the awesome podcasts that are members of the Straight Up Strange family, go to straightupstrange.com and get strange. Broadcast from a secret bunker somewhere outside of Nashville, Tennessee. This is the award-winning podcast, Era Reality. A few years ago, a map called Monsters in America, a cryptozoological map of the United States, was published by Hog Island Press of Philadelphia. You've probably seen it online because it seems like it was everywhere for a while. And it was described as, and I quote, possibly the first of its kind, a snapshot of American cryptozoology that brings together the Jersey Devil, Bigfoot, Mothman, Chupacabra, Shunkawakan, Caddy, the Honey Island Swamp Monster, and many more cryptids on one hand-drawn, hand-screened map. But it was missing a cryptid from Alabama. My home state actually has many cryptids, and I was very surprised that its most famous one, the Alabama White Thang, didn't make the map. Although the thing did make an appearance on version 2 of the map, it was still the only creature from Alabama that made the cut. And that got me to thinking about all the legends of cryptids that we have in Alabama, and I thought that this would make an excellent topic for my summer series. So tonight is part 1 of 3. This episode will cover 5 of the more famous cryptids of my home state, plus 1 hoax. Now, some people think that Alabama is known for the uh, Chocoloco monster, but that was a 1960s hoax perpetrated in Calhoun County. And that's what we're starting off with tonight is the hoax. So starting in mid-May of 1969, something began appearing at night in the forest by the Iron City cutoff and the Chocoloco Road between Iron City and Chocoloco. And this, was, of course, is, was in Alabama. Margaret Teague, who worked at the Cleburne County Hospital, was driving home late one night on the cutoff when she spotted something that she called, and I quote, a booger at the edge of the road. It walked on its hind legs and was covered with hair, and its head was reportedly really huge compared to the rest of its body. So she turned her car around in the middle of the road, So she was trying to get another look at the thing, and she caught it. Uh, She got the car caught, not the monster, but she got her car caught in a ditch. And um, she later told a reporter for the Aniston Star that, and and here's another quote, I just knowed the booger had me for sure, but it didn't. And she survived. Lived to tell the tale. Then in late May, A man driving down the Chocoloco Road saw what he described as a varmint, a humped back combination of a bear and a panther. The night after this, Johnny Ray Teague and three friends were driving in the same area when their car stalled. After they climbed out to look at the engine, they heard something crashing through the bushes beside the road, and they saw a beast that was the size of a cow gray or black in color, and had a hump on it, kind of like a camel. It had a huge head and big teeth. 
And of course, scared out of their minds, these guys jump back in their car and they lock the doors. The car wasn't going anywhere. They couldn't get it to start. So that was the only form of cover and protection that they had. So they jumped back in, locked the doors, and waited. And the monster, seeming to enjoy the captive audience, circled the car a few times before it just lumbered off into the trees. Other witnesses who saw this thing described it as gray or black with large teeth and a hump, similar to what the men had in the uh, stalled car had described. Some added that it had a long, stringy uh, head of hair that obscured its features. Now, when Johnny Teague finally got his car to start, he and his friends sped away down the road, and about half a mile from the encounter where they saw it, they claimed to have seen another three or four more of these creatures, and they were even larger than the first one that they saw. So by June of 1969... People from all over the state began patrolling the Chocoloco roads with guns and rifles and all kinds of weapons in tow. Several people fired shots at suspicious shadows or forms. Luckily, no one was killed or hurt that we know of. There were so many gun-toting men roaming around the area that the local farmers got kind of angry. And in fact, uh, one Mrs. Bobby Murphy told a reporter, and I quote, I'll tell you one thing, if one of our cows or bulls is shot and we can find out who it is, somebody's going to pay dear. So not only were the farmers mad, but the wives were mad too. The families were mad. Because, I mean, let's face it, you had a bunch of people running around uh, with guns shooting at, you know, anything that moved. And you're doing this at night and you're in someone's pasture and there's a big black cow or a dark-colored cow, and all you can see is the silhouette, and it's coming towards you, or you walk up on it or whatever, you're all, you're all, holy shit, bam, and you shoot it dead. That's, you know, or what if there's somebody else that's out there looking for this thing, or someone's just maybe on their own property minding their own business. This was really dangerous, and it really upset the locals. Fortunately, like I said, there was no one hurt or killed or injured or anything like that that we know of. And after June, the monster was no longer sighted. Everything died down, and it just kind of quietly went away. Now, there were no earlier legends for the Chocoloco monster, although Sasquatch-type monsters in Alabama has always been referred to as boogers, which is why Mrs. T referred to it as a booger. But we don't know at that point in time what the Chocoloco monster was or what the Chocoloco monster is. But you fast forward. From 1969 all the way to 2001, and in October, a Nances Creek resident named Neil Williamson revealed the truth about the Chocoloco monster to a reporter named Matthew Creamer. And Williamson said that back then, he didn't really have anything to do. He didn't have computers, didn't have the internet. There wasn't a lot of TV watching going on. So on a boring weekend night in 1969, Williamson, who at the time was 15 years old, snuck out of his house while his parents were asleep, got the car, drove down the county roads in their uh, car, the, the stolen car, and he realized that he had an old cow skull that he'd found Uh, while he was out hiking, and it was in the back seat of the car. So he got to thinking, and soon thereafter, he put on a long black coat, took the skull out to a dark stretch of road, and just waited. And when a car approached, he ran out with the skull held above his head, did a kind of dance, danced a little jig there, and ran back into the trees before the driver or passengers could get a good look at him. And he did this more than once. And on occasion, he wore a white sheet instead of the coat, which explains the variation in the witnesses' descriptions. So one night in June of 1969, as Williamson was playing the monster, he had a couple of friends with him, 
and he had told them, hey, I'm doing this thing. This is this whole thing is me. And uh, he took them out to play monster. So as he was dancing around doing his little monster dance while there was a, a truck that was approaching, the vehicle slowed down, and someone in the cab took several shots at Williamson. Now, of course, this scared the heck out of him, so he and his friends fled through the woods, and the person in the spotlight, hot on their heels, they had a, uh, the person in the spot, the person in the truck was hot on their heels. They had a spotlight in the truck, and they were shining the tree line trying to find him. Now, no one's hit, but Williamson popped out on the far side of the woods and ran across the pasture and crashed into a barbed wire fence, and that was his last performance as the Choco Loco monster because he got really scared. He could have died. So could his, his friends, as a matter of fact. Now, the shooter, the person that shot at him, we don't know who that was. His identity was never revealed, but he was quoted as saying that the monster ran back into the hills after he fired at it, letting out an almost human-like cry. And no doubt that was... Uh, Williamson as he crashed into the barbed wire fence. Because if you've never crashed into a barbed wire fence running full speed at night, uh, well, it doesn't matter what time of day it is, but if you've never crashed into a barbed wire fence while you're running at full speed, you don't know what pain is because that hurts. I've done that, and it hurts. So one has to wonder about Johnny Ray Teague and his companions, though, the guys in the car that got stranded on the side of the road. Remember, they fled in horror from this cow skull-topped apparition only to spot more of them, remember? There was three or four. They were bigger and supposedly more horrible than the first, and that was further along the Chocoloco Road. So did they feel the need to improvise on their story, or were they so panic-stricken that something like, you know, they saw some shadows of something or cows or bushes that were blowing in the breeze or something like that, or, you know, that they see something that became monsters in their minds. Whether deliberate or not, exaggerations like that can make legends grow. And that helped the legend of the Chocoloco monster grow from 1969 all the way up until 2001. So it had a pretty good run. And now that you know about the legendary hoax of Chocoloco Monster. Here are five supposedly real cryptids from my home state of Alabama. And the first one that we're going to talk about is the Wolf Woman of Mobile. The half-wolf, half-woman creature frightened the citizens of Mobile so much that people began calling the local newspaper, the Press Register, to report the sightings. On the 8th of April, 1971, the newspaper reported the phenomenon, complete with a drawing of the creature conceived by a newspaper artist. That same artist later said that he listened to as many as 50 phone calls that the press pressure had received night and day, and in approximately one week, they got 50 phone calls, 24 hours a day, all times of the day and night. And he went on to say that he wondered if maybe there wasn't something, you know, to this. Isn't there something out there? You get 50 phone calls reporting basically the same thing. So what did they report? Well, witnesses described the creature as pretty and hairy. The top half was a woman and the bottom was a wolf. Somebody, I don't have a name, but somebody that saw the thing said, and I quote, My daddy saw it down in the marsh and it chased him home. Now my mommy keeps all the doors and the windows locked. One witness heard that the creature had escaped from a circus sideshow, as is most of these legends like that, like the goat man from Goatman Bridge. You get that. You know, as a matter of fact, anytime you hear of a half animal, half human hybrid haunting the local area, whether it's the woods or the train tracks or the field or the house or whatever, it's always, you know, something that escaped from the traveling circus, a train wreck or something like that. 
So the reporter from the press register said that the fear of the witnesses who saw this thing seemed real, although the initial reports would have begun on April Fool's Day on this, okay? So this is important to remember because, remember, uh, the newspaper reported this on the 8th of April, 1971, and they had received 50 phone calls in a week's time. So if you take that, it looks like the initial phone call happened on April's Fool's Day of 1971. But it wasn't just the newspaper that was getting phone calls. The police were getting these calls too. And although officers wouldn't make an official comment, they did investigate to determine exactly what Mobile citizens were seeing. Sightings of half-wolf, half-human creatures have been reported throughout history, with the werewolf being the most common version of this, and the legends of anthropomorphic creatures stem from American Indian folklore and capture the imagination like skinwalkers, which are not really werewolves, much to the common misconception of what a skinwalker is. But Alabama doesn't have any history or legends of skinwalker-type creatures. The closest thing that we would come to it would be this, the Wolf Woman of Mobile. Now, within days, the sightings of this Mobile Wolf Woman stopped and have not been reported since. So you have to stop and think about what is going on here. So if you do your math... It looks like the first report started on April the 1st, 1971, which would have been, you know, that's traditionally April Fool's Day. So was this a hoax? That's the very first thing that you have to ask yourself was, was this a hoax? So there could be two versions of, or there could be, there could be two versions of the hoax as far as I'm concerned. And then you have a third version of everything. So let's talk about the hoaxes first. Two versions. Why do I say two versions? Well, it could be this. It could be someone dressed up in some sort of costume, some sort of homemade something or other, and, uh, you know, played a big April Fool's Day joke. And maybe it went so well that they decided to keep it up for a whole entire week. Or maybe that was the plan in the first place. Or it could have been a group of people that that were doing it. Uh, But what I don't see here in the reports is when I think of someone that is a wolf woman with the top half being a woman and and pretty or as was described and the bottom half being a wolf. Okay. I'm thinking more like traditional mermaid stuff here. Okay. So hear me out. A mermaid, half woman, half fish, top half is the woman, bottom half is the fish, right? She's all pretty and stuff like that. But traditionally, mermaids are topless, right? So did you have some woman that was topless running around out there with her boobies all shaking around doing an April Fool's Day joke? Or was this woman clothed? Was it a guy that was dressed up as a woman? I don't. I, I, I didn't get any reports of the person being topless. So we don't know. But that's what I think of when I think of a, a half-wolf half woman with the top half being human and the bottom half being wolf. I think of someone, and maybe I'm a pervert, I don't know, but I think of of some sort of creature running around out there that is topless. So, you know, was it a hoax? Did someone play a prank and maybe it went so well that they decided to continue it for a week? The second version of the hoax that I have is what if it wasn't really anyone running around out there at all? What if no one saw it? What if it was just people calling in to the newspaper to start off with? What if it was some teenagers or some college age students? Because Mobile is a college town. I don't know if you know that. There's University of South Alabama, big time college right there in Mobile. Um, so Mobile is a college town. There's a lot of young people in Mobile because, you know, 
what's in what who goes to college, you know, young people, right? So there's a lot of young people running around Mobile. So maybe somebody got bored and decided, uh, hey, we're going to call the newspaper as a prank on April Fool's. Now, because if you saw something like that, who would you call? Really, realistically, would you, the first thing would you think would be to call the newspaper or would you think to call the cops? Personally speaking, I would probably call the cops, you know. So what was this a person or a group of people doing a prank on April Fool's Day, calling the newspaper, maybe saying people are calling the cops, you know, uh, maybe um, it was something just as simple as that. Some people just trying to get some a story going, you know. I don't know. And, of course, you know, the the third version of this whole thing is that, that there was something real, that this was not a hoax, that this was actually a real flesh-and-blood type creature. The thing that I, I have with that, the problem I have with that is if it was a real flesh-and-blood creature, why was it only seen for one week from April the 1st to the 8th of 1971 and then never seen again? That's what concerns me. Um, nonetheless, we don't have any proof. There's no evidence. Nobody snapped a picture of it. There's been no DNA collected or anything. Uh, there's just no pictures that anybody snapped. We have, you know, a drawing that was done by an illustrator in the newspaper. So who knows how accurate that actually is. So, you know, real or not, it is an Alabama cryptid legend, and it makes the number one that we're talking about on my list. And these aren't going by a particular order, like who's the, you know, I do a lot of top 10 countdowns, and I top down from, uh, I count it down from 10 to 1. This is not like that. This is, there's no one that I prefer or whatever. So the second one we're going to talk about is, of course, Bigfoot. Now, Bigfoot's been seen in all 50 states. Reports of sighting of Bigfoot in Alabama are, in fact, nothing new. And as it, really the sightings were, they were plentiful enough for Jim Smith to start the Alabama Bigfoot Society. So, you know, it's not like Alabama is a rarity for Bigfoot. We got a lot of woods in Alabama, a lot of places, even though comparatively to a lot of states or most states, Alabama's not that huge, but we do have a big rural area of Alabama. And there's a lot of places that just uh, are either there's very few inhabitants to no inhabitants at all, and it's a great place for Bigfoot to hang out. I don't necessarily know about Bigfoot like making a permanent home in Alabama, but definitely if if you think about Bigfoot roaming across the United States and being a migratory creature, if it gets cold up north or out west. The South is a good place to do your wintering, right? Because it's hot and it's humid. And the, we just don't get the same type of winters that everybody else does. Does it get cold? Yeah, but not as cold. Definitely as a big, hairy creature would not want to spend June, July, and August in Alabama. You know, that's just got to be miserable. So anyway, a guy named Jim Smith starts the Alabama Bigfoot Society. Now, he reports on sightings on the group's website and also describes ways people can tell a Sasquatch has been in the area, like the presence of bent or snapped trees, trees arranged in a teepee shape, you know, all those things that we already know. So he became interested in Bigfoot all the way back in 1971, maybe a pattern, I don't know, popular date. So he became uh, interested in Bigfoot in 1971 while he was in high school in East Central Alabama. Now, at the time, he was 15, and that year, people in his area had one or more of these creatures roaming around in the woods in the area, and it was a fairly large area, and there were multiple sightings over several months, and he says that he himself saw this giant, hairy, non-existent creature for himself on more than one occasion. And he also says that he remains as interested in Bigfoot as he now as he was at the age of 15. He says that ever since his first sighting, he spent countless hours 
in the field investigating sighting reports and has listened to countless witnesses relive their own encounter or if they've had more than one, he's talked to them. And so we do have in Alabama our own Bigfoot Society, our own Bigfoot Research Organization, and Bigfoot does make appearances, I wouldn't say on the reg, but Bigfoot has made enough appearances in Alabama for it to not be a one-off thing. And there's no one particular area that he is more prominent to appear in than any other as far as I know. Uh, But you get down closer to the southern part of the state and the sightings are fewer. So maybe Bigfoot prefers uh, central and northern Alabama to the southern part of the state. I don't know. Now, at the top of the podcast here, I mentioned the Alabama white thang, and it's not thing, T-H-I-N-G, it's thang, T-H-A-N-G, because, you know, we're in the south, right? So the Alabama white thang is number three on my list. So the legend of the Alabama white thang has been prevalent since the 1940s in the triangle between Morgan, Etowa, and Jefferson counties, where people report seeing a creature that's more than seven feet tall and covered in white hair. And it's been sighted in Happy Hollow, Walnut Grove, Moody's Chapel, and Wheeler Wildlife Refuge. So it's got a big swath of area that it's been sighted in. The creature is known for its ability to move extremely quickly despite its size and for its eerie screech that sounds like a woman's scream. Some describe the scream as sounding like that of a panther. Many people speculated that the white thing is an albino Bigfoot or maybe a large albino bear. A man by the name of Peter J. Gossett writes on his website, Uh, of Winston County history um, is called uh, freestateofwinston.org that his aunt, uh, friend of Martin Smith, knew people who reported seeing the white thing. Now, uh, Smith told Gossett that, uh, here's a quote, okay, old man George Norris seen it over there in Indian Graveyard. And he said it looked like a lion, you know, bushy betwixt the dog and a lion. It was white and slick with long hair. It had a slick tail down to the end of the tail, a big old bush of hair. He leant up against a tree and fell asleep. And when he woke up, the sun was just rising and the white thing was lying right there beside him. And it was looking at him. And he said it didn't offer to hurt him or nothing. And that's the quote. (laughs) In Huntsville, the phrase Alabama white thing is used to describe a humanoid, possibly alien figure spotted in caves or drainage ditches in Jones Valley along Governor's Drive and on Monte Sano Mountain. The creature is described as having no eyes or ears and being completely white. Now, there is a Facebook page for the Alabama white thing, and uh, it is called Alabama White Thang, T-H-A-N-G. Don't spell it thing because it's not that. It's a thang. It's the Alabama White Thang. Now, I do have a short clip here that I'm going to play you of an author, uh, Casey Kazik, who is being interviewed on uh, WAFF out of uh, Huntsville, Alabama. It's a local television news station out of Huntsville, WAFF. This is a... Uh, used under the authorization of fair use. Uh, And this is Kelly Kasich's uh, very short version of the Alabama white thang. Um, On that note, though, something else that's kind of crazy, you got to educate me on this. I've never heard of the Alabama white thang. What is this? And it is thang, T-H-A-N-G. It is thang. Um, What what is this? It is. It's very interesting because it's different things. Some people think uh, it's an albino Bigfoot. But others describe him as like a goat-like creature who's white. 
So, and he roams now there, Bigfoot has allegedly been spotted in Montesano, Green Mountain, all the mountains around Huntsville. So my advice is just, if you see an albino, anything in the woods, run. <laughs> that is really good advice. Kelly, you always have good advice, great stories. You are so knowledgeable in all things Alabama and beyond. Thank you. And that was author Kaylee Kazik being interviewed by Peyton Walker on uh, Huntsville, Alabama's local news channel, WAFF. Now, I do want to say, in, in reference to the Bigfoot thing that I talked about just a little while ago, I said that I did not think that Bigfoot was uh, seen as often in the southern half of the state as it was in the central and northern part of the state. However, I will have to say that the city of Evergreen, Alabama, which is very close to Mobile, has been officially designated as the Bigfoot capital of Alabama, uh, and that's only because uh, some people saw Bigfoot down there who were, um, I think it was the Gulf Coast Bigfoot Organization or something like that. Uh, anyway, it was a Florida uh, Bigfoot uh, research group uh, in Evergreen, Alabama, is very close to Florida, is very close to Mobile. They're, you know, it's all right in that same area. And these people claimed that they saw Bigfoot in the Evergreen area, and they proclaimed it as uh, Evergreen, Alabama, as the Bigfoot uh, capital of Alabama. So just because it has that stigma, that stipulation on it, I was going to say stigma, which is a horrible term, um, just because it has that designation does not mean that Bigfoot is seen there more than any other time uh, anywhere else in the state. I just, so before someone like does a little Google search or something and sends me an email like, oh, you're a liar or you're wrong or whatever. But uh, I just wanted to clarify that before I proceeded any further. So that was the little short brief clip about the Alabama white thing. The next and the next creature I'm going to talk about is uh, it, this is also a very popular cryptid type creature. Uh, I don't know if cryptid would be the most appropriate term to use, but this is another one of Alabama's more famous unknown creatures. Alabama white thing would have to be number one, and this would have to be number two, hugging Molly. So, <clears throat> for mothers wanting their children to hurry home at dark, the legend of the witch-like hug and Molly is a big helper for that. For children, she was just a downright frightening thing. Now, this occurs in Abbeville, Alabama, where the legend of Holly, uh, hug and Molly began decades ago. Now, Abbeville is uh, not too far away from Lake Eufaula, which is kind of close to central Alabama. Lake Eufaula is a huge uh, man-made lake in the state of Alabama. I grew up uh, camping and fishing on Lake Eufaula for decades and passed by or passed through Abbeville going there many, many times. And I never saw Hug and Molly, uh, never encountered her, but I'm very familiar with that area. So legend claims that a phantom woman would appear to children, but only at night. She would grab onto them, hug them really tightly, and then scream in their ears. Now, she never heard them other than maybe, you know, the yelling in their ears, uh, but she never caused any physical harm. They say that she was around maybe seven feet tall and wore a dark colored clothing and a wide brimmed hat sounds kind of like the wicked witch of the west doesn't it um so one version of the story claims that molly was the ghost of a woman who had lost a, an infant child and dealt with this tragedy by going around and just hugging local children and another version of the legend says that Molly was a professor at the former Southeast Alabama Agriculture School who was trying to keep students safe by keeping them off the streets at night. So today in Abbeville, they actually have 
a, uh, I guess, a, a tribute to Hug and Molly. If you go downtown Abbeville, there is a cafe named Hug and Molly's. And it's in an old pharmacy, and it's complete with a soda fountain, and they offer treats like sandwiches, not sandwiches, but sandwiches with a T S A N D W I T C H E S, sandwiches and Molly fingers, whatever those are. I'm I'm, I'm assuming they're chicken fingers. I don't know. <laughs> That's I don't know that I would want to eat something called Molly fingers. And there's a creature ghost around town named Hug and Molly. <laughs> So um, just in case you want to look at this place, if, if you're passing through, maybe you're going on a, a haunted road trip or something like that, and you're going through Alabama, and you're going to pass close to Abbeville or go through Abbeville, if you want to stop and eat at Hug and Molly's, it's located at 129 Kirkland Street in Abbeville, Alabama. Now, Hug and Molly has never been said to or known to harm a child, but like I said, she does present as a scary type creature dressed in black with a wide black hat, wide brim, seven feet tall, runs up to children, grabs them, squeezes the life out of them, hugs them really tight and screams in their ear. Now the screaming is, I can understand if there is a a ghost of uh, somebody who lost a child. Or maybe their child was kidnapped or something like that. You know, I can understand them wanting to keep the children safe at night. Maybe their child, uh, something happened to them at night. I don't know. But I don't get this screaming. What what I couldn't find, at, and I, maybe I just need to dig a little bit deeper, but I didn't find anything about uh, why Hug and Molly is supposed to scream at people. I really would like to know. And the last Thing I'm going to talk about. God, we're already at number four. The last creature that I'm going to talk about for tonight is called the Downy Booger. Now, remember, I've said this earlier that Sasquatches or Bigfoot in Alabama, those type creatures are known as boogers. I know it's the southern thing. You feel free to laugh. I find it funny too. So, this, however, the downy booger has to be classified separately from Bigfoot or Sasquatch. And I'm going to tell you why here. So there was a series of sightings of the downy booger, which is supposed to be a half human and half animal that were reported in the late 1800s. Now, there is um, a family in Downey. Um, well, their last name's Downey, and and the that's what the Downey Booger is named after. Okay, so according to Joyce Ferris, whose husband was a descendant of the Downies of Winston County, the tale is part of his family lore. Now, there's another descendant of the Downies named Vera Whitehead, and she recorded the history where. Uh, Ferris published on a website of Winston County history is called freestateofwinston.org. And Whitehead wrote that in the latter part of the 1800s, Winston County, Alabama was known for the Downey Booger. Cousins John and Joe Downey were coming back home from a community dance one night when they saw the creature. So John and Joe were on horseback. They were riding their horses, you know, chatting about what happened at the dance probably talking about chicks or, you know, women or something like that, who was cute or who they danced with or whatever. And suddenly a strange-looking creature bearing both the resemblance of a human and an animal leapt out in front of them. And they turned around again and uh, started home. And as they approach the sand bed where this weird creature had appeared, the horses came to an abrupt stop. Now, they... You know, tried to get the horses to go, said they gouged them in the side, you know, started hitting them with the bridles and everything, but they wouldn't budge an inch. And finally, they turned around and rode back to um, the house on a different route that they could take, but it was a longer route. The, the horses would not continue on the route where this downy booger thing jumped out. Now, others 
also saw the creature nicknamed the Downy Booger, and one sighting led to its demise, according to the stories. On a moonlit night in early fall, a man named Jim Jackson loaded up his two-horse wagon with his barrels of homemade moonshine and was going to the commissary in Galloway, which was a mining town a few miles from his home. So he was riding down on the wagon. He glanced over his right shoulder, and he saw this creature walking on two feet behind his wagon. Now, he got really scared. He froze, and he said his first impulse was to, you know, start taking a whip to the horses and try to outrun this thing, whatever it was. However, he remembered that he had a gun on the wagon seat behind him, so he took out the gun, aimed it, fired twice. Apparently, he did hit the creature because he said it screamed like a woman in distress and went lipping away on three feet. Now, the news about this spread quickly, and Jim Jackson shot the downy booger. Everybody saw, everybody knows it. So they formed a posse, and they combed the forest, and they only found traces of blood leading from the sand bed to a distant cliff. And until this day, this incident is repeated among the, Winst- the residents of Winston County. Now, what the downy booger was was still forever a mystery. So here's the thing that I'm saying that it has to be separate from Bigfoot. They're saying it's half human, half animal, right? Well, you could kind of say Bigfoot is half human, half animal. Maybe. You know, uh, it walks on two legs, has two arms, has a humanoid-type face, you know. Um, so you could kind of see where in the 1800s people would see this and they would be like, oh, it was half human, half animal. But what strikes it as different than a Bigfoot is that apparently this thing had four legs, right? Because when Winst, when uh, the man, when what was his name, Jackson shot it, it limped away on three legs. So he had to have shot it in one of four legs, right? So this thing was a four-legged creature that had a resemblance between some sort of half animal and half human. Now, it doesn't describe as which half was human, which half was animal, or what the exact uh, features were like. Um was this another incidence of a hoax? Uh, because when they shot it, or when he shot it, he said it screamed like a woman in distress. Was this some young lady or some young man who was in disguise trying to you know, scare people to, to get his jollies and then got shot? Well, there's no recorded history of anyone going missing, you know, because the thing apparently ran to a cliff and uh, they didn't. Did it jump off the cliff? Did it fall? We don't know, but it was never seen nor heard from again. So did they kill it? So if it was someone hoaxing, it had to have been someone not from the area or someone's child or husband, father, whoever went missing and they never said anything. That doesn't make sense to me. So the fact that um, we don't have any reports of any real humans going missing or being shot Uh, and we have this four-legged, weird-looking creature that they know that was shot because they found traces of blood and tracked it. So this had to have been some sort of real creature. But what it was will be forever a mystery. And those are five Alabama legends, and there's more to come because we're going to do two other shows about this, but those are just five of the many, many legends that float around through my home state of Alabama. The most famous would obviously, like I said, have to be the Alabama white thing, and then there's Huggin' Molly. So if you want to find out more about the Alabama white thing or Huggin' Molly or any of the other creatures that I've talked about on this, all you got to do is just... uh, Do a good old Google search, and you can find all kinds of information about it. Now, as I said, Bigfoot and my last creature, the Downy Booger, even though Bigfoot are called boogers in Alabama, 
they're going to have to be considered to be these two two separate things because one was a four-legged creature. The other is, of course, Bigfoot has two legs. So there you go. Those are my five Alabama legends. Going to be talking about a little bit more on the next episode of my summer series. Well, that does it for this episode of Hair Reality. Don't forget to send me those emails. Let me know what you thought about tonight's show, or if you got any other kind of comments or questions you want to ask me, that's sandman at parareality.com. And also, don't forget to follow me on all of my social media outlets. The next episode of Parareality is going to drop on June 15th at 8 o'clock p.m. Central U.S. time. Eric is going to be back in the secret bunker next Friday, and he and I are going to be interviewing Demon Seer June Lundgren. So it's going to be a very interesting interview. Can't wait. We've been talking to her, trying to get her on the podcast for a while now. We finally got everyone's schedule worked out. So it's going to be a really interesting podcast. Next Friday, June 15th, 8 o'clock p.m. Central U.S. time, Eric and I are going to be interviewing the Demon Seer herself, Miss June Lundgren. So turn on, tune in, and find out. I hope that this podcast opens up your mind to new ways of thinking, expands your consciousness, and produces a change in the way you see the world. If you wish to change, you must lift the veil of ignorance that has been cast over your eyes. Only then will you see the true power of the universe. Hope you have a wonderful evening, great weekend, and I will see you again next Friday. Good night, everybody. If you wish to change... You must first lift the veil of ignorance that has been cast over your eyes. Only then will you see the true power of the universe.